Welcome to the Leading Real Change podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, an expert in workplace culture change. From my unique background in behavior science, public health, and community advocacy, I help corporate leaders with evidence-based individual, team, and organizational change to create thriving workplace cultures for all. In the Leading Real Change podcast, I interview dedicated and passionate change makers about their careers, how they lead change, and what leaders can do today to make a difference, to build healthy, inclusive workplace cultures for all. I'm excited to share these examples of real workplace change with you. You'll learn about effective strategies that are working and how to overcome real barriers to change that challenge us every day. I hope you'll feel inspired and more confident to keep leading change in your workplace. Please share this podcast with other HR, DEI or ERG leaders who you know are working hard, but are struggling to have an impact and need more support to effectively create a thriving workplace culture for all today. Hi, I'm Emma Proud. I live in Kigali with my family, my husband and my three kids. And currently I'm an independent consultant working on systems innovation and helping development organizations be ready to adapt. Great. I'm so glad to speak to a system specialist. So this is going to be such an important conversation to frame a lot of the other conversations that I've been having. So let's first start with describing your career journey. Thank you. I guess I accidentally started my career in the private sector, which wasn't really where I had expected to find myself for a good few years, actually, in a consulting firm. And then I took to the road and traveled and did a master's in anthropology. And in the end, just up sticks and moved to Ethiopia in the hope of finding work that felt much more kind of akin to my values. And I was really lucky I found work with NGOs. So I started working as an intern for Save the Children. And what was beautiful about that was it was a chance to apply anthropology actually in a field that I cared so much about. It was about trying to understand local systems, in particular customary institutions and how customary institutions work together to share land and rights among pastoralists, rather than adding our own solutions or coming in with our own solutions. And I think that set me on a path to really thinking much more systemically And then I've worked for Mercy Corps for 10 years, starting working in implementing market systems development programs. So again, thinking what's happening in the system already? What's blocking the system from actually working? How can we facilitate change rather than doing the change ourselves? Part of that work, when we started thinking about systems, I started implementing and then went on to support programs around the world to do similar stuff. And recognize that the systems part was really important, understanding the theory and how teams interacted and how they managed actually was really important. So we were talking a lot about adaptive management. And that was really helpful because obviously we're working in complexity. And there was a narrative at the time of we would love to adapt, but the donor won't let us. The people who give us money are stopping us. And it took a lot for us to say, actually, that's true. And there's a lot more we could do than we are doing at the moment. So that led me into this lens of like organizational change. How can we, as an organization, try and nudge and support certain behaviors like being adaptive, like understanding complexity and trying things? So at Mercy Corps, I was thinking about that. I was working on organizational agility And we did a systemic kind of approach to a leadership training that was working with leaders and their teams to try and help teams and leaders be more adaptive. And then I jumped a wonderful consultancy called Brink, an innovation consultancy, doing similar work, but with different organizations. So, for example, with Oxfam America and Lego Foundation and the British Ministry of Justice and doing some really interesting work with OECD. And now... I've become an independent consultant and interestingly I'm zooming both in and out in that process. So I'm working with a couple of organizations really specifically on systems innovation 
And also my plan is to be able to zoom out more and have space to join the dots between the pieces of work and really understand at that meta level and help more organizations or whatever think about complexity and systems and what needs to happen inside in order to create the change in the world. That's fantastic. That's a great description. And it does feel a little mind blowing, even though I've been thinking about this type of thing a lot myself. So let's really take it slowly to help our listeners think through what that actually means. I think it's so important. You're talking about a type of leadership that you need, flexibility, but also thinking about, okay, there's some things that might be out of our control, but what can we actually still do within a system? Because again, I think most people really feel like everything beyond me as an individual is out of my control, yet there's so much we can actually do to change systems. If you were giving us a 101, what would you actually say to someone, and maybe we can think through this in these workplace examples that my audience is probably thinking about more. We're in a system that we feel like is out of our control and is not working in the way we want to. What would we do? Where would we start? Hmm. It's interesting as well, because something I've been thinking about a lot at the moment is fractals. So fractals are kind of things which are self-similar at different scales, right? So even when we say the system, and there's a bit of a challenge around the language, isn't it? Because the language of systems can also feel really alienating for people. And you often see that sort of glazed look. So it's interesting to think about how to talk about this almost without talking about systems. But if I use the language for a minute, it's interesting. Are we thinking then about the whole system, right? The organizations you're talking about are trying to change. But organization is itself a system and the teams that you're working within are also systems. So yeah, I guess, first of all, what are the boundaries of the system we're talking about? Do you mean within the organization or perhaps in the world? And I suppose too, you can even say that systems like in your home, when I've been talking to a lot of dads, they've talked about, we just end up having a system in the house to split the work and to share the load and to communicate So yeah, I agree. It's not these big frightening things like would a different definition is just how we work together. Mm, I love that. I've been doing some reading actually this last few weeks or thinking on a school of thought that's moved away from complex adaptive systems when talking about systems that humans are involved in and they talk about complex responsive processes. Language aside, What they're ostensibly saying is it's all in the relationships, right? And systems are not these abstract things which are outside us, but they're formed between conversations and gestures. Gestures being like in a workplace, your email, your body language, also at home, like you say, in the family. And those micro level kind of interactions shape the big system if you like and then the big system shapes the way that we interact so that for me feels really empowering because if we can start to understand how we're being in that moment then that is something that we can shape and I know this a phrase that has always sounded so sorry Gandhi sounds trite because we use it so much this be the change that you want to see in the world if we see that systems are about the relationships that we're mimicking at a small level, how we want the world to be at a big level, then that's actually incredibly empowering. And like you say, if we think about equality, what can we do in our home to be modeling and living that in our interactions, or even when we go to the shop, right? And how we communicate with people. That's within our gift to shape something that will shape the whole world and so I think that's so important and I think about it as like ripples on a pond because they influence us and we influence them but there definitely seems to be this sticking point and again I don't know if that's more so here in the U.S. to other places and even I was reading an article recently about male allies And the article was claiming, written by men who had investigated other men, saying that men tend to not believe they are influenced by other things. So I often see that situation where people are denying that they're shaped by other people and also denying that you can shape 
other people. I think partly because they want to say, this was my intention in my action. It's not my fault if you take it wrong. Or the other way around is nobody's opinion affects mine. I'm independent. I have my own opinion. But yet the reality is we are shaped by others and we can shape others. So I really believe in what you're saying, but there seems to be a zeitgeist kind of against that. Have you come across that in other places that you've worked? Yeah, I have. And I think that the other place that my head's going is to think of some of these bits that are like at the bottom of an iceberg of how systems worked. So the mental models that underpin how we work and the relationships and the power dynamics and they're the stuff that's so hidden that we don't realize it shapes us so I'm thinking of those examples that you use and they're also really hard to uncover but something that comes up for me is when we had our first child our daughter Iris and the conflicts that you end up having as we ended up having anyway as two carers who carry mental models that you don't even realize you've got and you didn't realize were even important to you until they butt up against the mental models of someone else, like whether it's around sleeping or feeding or starting breastfeeding, stopping breastfeeding, all these things. And you don't realize how much your perception has been formed by your family, your culture. My husband comes from a different culture from me, right? It's not until you start having those conversations that you get confronted with it. I guess it's the anthropological thing. You notice the other most of the boundary of yourself. Or you notice yourself more at the boundary of the other too. Exactly. And I think that's why it's so important when I think about trying to help people lead change and lead systems change. We tend to, again, focus on the individual and get stuck in that space. But it's like none of this works unless it's in relation to somebody else. So this whole concept of quiet quitting and just doing your own thing, but not telling anyone, I understand the threat that has if you're actually sharing, okay, I'm limiting my hours. But again, it works so much better when it's done in concert with other people. And again, if you're setting boundaries, you don't know if they're acceptable until the other person you're setting them with accepts them and you have a conversation about what that means. So I agree this sort of trying to do it in isolation is not only ineffective (laughs) because we are in relation with other people and we can have so many benefits of the relationships, but also because when we do these things together with other people, we actually can also have such a better experience of learning together because we can find role models who we can imitate from. We can find people who can give us feedback on maybe what we could do better. We can find people that say, what you're doing is great. And if you do that in isolation, you get none of that social learning. So that's definitely something that I've been trying to emphasize more. It's not just a numbers game. This is the best way we learn anyway. Yeah, and there's a beautiful model that I've been using a bit recently about systems change, because what you find about a lot of the stuff about the systems thinking is that the language becomes quite obtuse, right? And it ties us up in knots of trying to understand it. But what do we have to do to change it? And there's a model called the Bacana two loop model, which was designed by Margaret Wheatley and Deborah Fries. And I can describe it a bit in a minute, but What they talk about is how it's not true that a single person can create change. And they talk about the power of emergence and emergence very much through connections like you've described and helping nurturing those connections so that basically a new system arises from the magic that happens with people to place. It's not even just about learning, right? It's like imagining what that new system could look like, the emergent system. Yes, learning, sharing together, building confidence together. And then another part that they talk about is also telling stories about it so that other people feel confident to join. So yes, I'm totally with you. I think it's really interesting to think about how creating those connections can create something which goes beyond those connections. And I think you just helped me unlock something that I've been saying, but I couldn't quite pin 
what it was, the reason. So definitely I've learned from my research, obviously collect a lot of data, try and use the best scientific methods. But when we would go in to see policymakers, yes, we got through the door because we had research studies and we had represented that research in the simplest way, but with really clear, compelling data. But that never got us to actually persuade a policymaker to make a change. What it was, was the story. And so I've said that the stories are the things that actually elicit our empathy and then hopefully compassion so that empathy is mixed with action to actually do something. But I think what you just described there was another advantage of the story. We can say the data around inequity and people can believe it or not. That's the reality we have to face now is not everyone believes the truth or the data anymore. But the stories if they give you confidence that you can do it. So stories of change can be so compelling because they they let you see somebody else overcame these barriers. Somebody else made a change in their life. So yes, I do now have confidence. And again, you can't get that confidence, that personal confidence from a data point as you can from a story. There's quite a lot about storytelling in systems change, right? And part of it is telling the story of the changed system, which I think is what you're describing, and it's so powerful. And another part is telling stories as a way to change the system and almost inviting people into those conversations to even just talk. And it's amazing how powerful that is to guide people, perhaps even just with a few questions together and holding that space, which perhaps loops back again to what you're saying a second ago, that change is the dynamic, that actually in the process of telling the stories together, you're changing that dynamic, which is changing the system, which is also interesting to think about how to play with, how to invite those policymakers that you're talking about, not even just sharing their stories, but inviting them into the storytelling. Exactly. So yes, it seems like a safer invite to ask someone to share their story instead of sharing their solutions, sharing a system solution, which sounds so overwhelming, to share their stories. Like you say, it does change the dynamic. And we've seen that in the workplace, people that share stories of having a family struggle, it can totally change how a manager is perceived if they share those types of stories. So maybe we could do that. Can you talk us through an example of a change that you've made or that you've worked on that you feel could really help people understand what this looks like in practice. And don't worry if it takes a little while to explain that example, but I think this definitely feels like some bigger concepts here that we're talking about. And again, certainly words that are new to me, like fractional thinking about what what does that mean? So it would be great with something really practical. Pick a story that you want to tell of successful change that sort of exemplifies some of these things we've been talking about, or just is one that you're really excited about maybe I have two that pop to mind but the one that I'm working on now is perhaps interesting and I think it's also exciting I'm working with an NGO who works on climate and has a new leadership and is excited to become more systemic intentionally right and embracing complexity understanding complexity, choosing their leverage points, and recognizing that they need to change both kind of what they're focusing on and how they're working internally to get there. So it's a neat way of also thinking about the fractals, because they really are thinking, what's the change we want to make in the world? Considering that, what change do we want to create internally? And what's really coming up for me in the organization now is thinking about what does that mean also for how I need to be myself? It's a big change. And there's a lot of uncertainty and pain, I guess I could say, too. And a nice thing about this Bacana model is it talks really explicitly about the need to hospice through change. So recognizing that change is hard and actually there's a really active role of talking about that pain, holding that pain. And also protecting that dominant system as you're going through change protecting stabilizing right and telling people it's okay the day-to-day can continue we're not going to burn the house down you're safe basically I guess is what I'm saying and we're going to 
compost is language that's used, the good stuff. Because I think something that's often missed in these change processes is the acknowledgement and appreciation of all the great stuff that's happened and what people have poured themselves into and the care that they've given and the relationships they've got and honoring that, right? And saying, we're gonna have a conversation not just about what should change, but about what we want to build on. And I love this image of compost because it fertilizes the new system. It nourishes and we're creating from that. So in this process, we've done an all organization thing, thinking about the future for both the world and this organization. Another thing that I love about the Bacana two loop model is that emergent system, you have a real opportunity to imagine and visualize. And I've been doing quite a lot of thinking recently about the power of that visualization. And I think it's wonderful. There's lots of beautiful kind of quotes, think why it's so important to first imagine the future that you want to step into. Donella Meadows, these are wonderful systems thinker and a beautiful writer said the future can't be predicted but it can be envisioned and brought lovingly into being um, and this sense of if you don't know what you're going for you can't get there so how would we like the emergent system to be we've been through a process of doing that at multiple scales so for the organization and for the world and then thinking through okay what's holding us in the dominant system what barriers are there basically that would stop us reaching that? What incentives, what norms are holding us where we are? And how can we create those sort of attractors to pull people to the emergent system? And part of that is also around these that we've talked about. Like once we've started naming the qualities of the emergent system, you can see signs that they are already emerging. And it's very powerful to then start connecting those elements right whether they're people or ideas so they grow in that confidence that we're talking about one of the things that's come up right through this process is to think okay these are some of the things that are holding us in our existing space or the things that might stop us from getting to the emergent system things like values our governance process decision governance and decision making our structure how we work together and what we're doing at the moment is working in little agile teams if you like of sort of six people working on each of those through a bit of a design sprint process to try and think what could that look like but rather than just talking about it and doing consultations they're going into actually be prototyping and I noticed that it's really hard to do that in quite a different way because there's this sense of the need for consensus, bringing people along and trusting that you can do that in a different way by that you are trusted as part of the organization and that you can bring people into the process also by testing things with them, talking to them about it, designing with and alongside rather than a traditional consultation process is quite interesting to think about. And trust comes up really strongly. So there are teams who are going through this process, which will then be tested and iterated on with the whole of the organization. Decisions will be made at that organization level. And at the same time, recognizing that it's an uncomfortable process of change. What we're doing is we had one just today, a change network. So an informal group of people who can come together basically just to talk about how this feels. So today we talked, what are the tensions and trade-offs for you personally and for the organization that you can see coming up? And then a process about what are your concerns? What are your hopes? What is a step that you might take as you start thinking about what that future could be? And I find those spaces and it comes again to that relationship part to be really transformative and I'm grappling with and certainly going to adjust to make sure that in these teams yes there's a process yes there's a process it's nice to lead people through a design process the space actually is the most transformative thing and so how to not create additional stress 
through that systems change, but actually create the space for possibility. Yeah, feels important. I don't know if that's concrete enough. Let me know how I can elaborate. Those seem like some fantastic examples. And I think there's so many pieces there of what you're saying that I'm also trying to help people with think about these types of system level changes through the workplace. And you really need to one have people that are creating these prototypes and doing these small experiments, because we think that change comes from just some big change happens and then everything changes. But it is, it's these small prototypes and small experiments that help us move forward. And also, I think from the perspective that I learned from doing my research was that if you ask people what they need and what they want, they really don't know, or they think they know based on their model of behavior change, which is all I need to change is control and willpower. And those two things are not related to change. So again, once you actually give somebody an example of here's a potential solution to this problem, then they can start to really give good input. Whereas if you just say, what do you think abstractly, then the information that I've ever received from that type of qualitative work has never been as rich as when they've actually got something. I always talk about it being like just this straw man. It's okay, if you don't like it, burn it down and build something else. And they can at that stage because they have some reference point. Um, So I think those prototypes are so important. And I can also imagine what you're doing is you're doing it in an equitable or shared decision-making, shared power way. Because I think a lot of companies go and develop task force, for example, to solve some of these problems. But then there seems to be more of a hierarchy in there and that someone is the expert in this thing and they come in as that expert. Whereas really what I feel like we have to acknowledge is none of us know what's really going to work. So none of us are experts. So we're all equal here in this space. But then I absolutely love how you're addressing the fear and uncertainty and tension that comes through change. And I definitely really acknowledge that because I think even as we try to help people think through what systems change is, then this idea of the complexity and the system, it is, it's overwhelming, there's fear, there's risk, there's uncertainty. And that's just for you to lead it. Then you try and bring it into your organization and change people who want the old system to live, not die. (laughs) And so there is, there's a lot of tension. And like you say, there can be real struggles with change. I was very much advising leaders to think about the other person and to acknowledge that their barriers to change are quite rational and also emotional, but I love that you're actually giving people the space to just acknowledge those and have those conversations. I think that's so important, not just trying to address them, but to talk about it and let people get those concerns out and be heard. Yeah, absolutely. I I love what you say about consulting, but Henry Ford quote if I'd asked people what they'd wanted they would have said faster horses that always that always springs to mind for me there's some interesting stuff about roles too and archetypes in change and I've been trying over the last couple of weeks to think through because I'm enjoying this the kind of model thinking through what are some of the roles that are attached and that also leads to quite interesting conversations because recognizing that we contain multitudes, right? And it's not that you have a role in this change process, but that you might be excited and scared. You might want to protect the system because it serves you really well and you've got where you are because of the existing system and you recognize the importance for innovation and you're visionary. Or you don't want this change, right? You do want change, but you don't think this team are doing it right or you don't want any change. And it's quite interesting to have something like that to be able to talk about it. And people almost feel more comfortable talking about how they think others are in it. But it's still a really interesting conversation tool for what's happening in the organization or during this process. That is interesting. 
because in some ways you can right talk about yourself as though you're talking through somebody else's mouthpiece <laughs> you're trying to represent someone else but in fact you're actually talking about your own concerns so that's a great way to allow people to do that but i think this and is so important and it reminds me really of what i struggled with when i was going through change when i left my career in academia from burnout i was very much stuck in being very sad about it, just feeling a great loss and grief and loss of identity. And at the same time, it was the right decision. And I was relieved to be moving on. So it's so fascinating. I really had to um, come to grips with that mindset, the and mindset that I could be sad and happy about the same thing. And I think that's such a great one to think back to, because again, our mindsets are important in these conversations where we started from in some ways. But as long as we don't get stuck in, okay, my mindset is the only thing that needs to be a certain way for me to change. Whereas our mindsets have to hold these dualities and go ahead anyway. Yeah. I want to come back to what you're saying about it's not just our mindsets, but one of the games that we've been playing, I feel like often in these change processes, it is serious work, but you need to also not take yourself too seriously, right? Like through the process, what can you do to embody the values of the emergent system? So there's something that's playful and experimental and collaborative, right? So what can you be doing to give people a taste of this as they go through the process? And in a way, it's a little bit like storytelling, right? But it's the experience. You feel it, right? You always feel changed because of it. And one of the, the games that we've played is the improv game, Yes And, where you say, oh, yeah, we're going to have a picnic. And I don't know. And we're going to have it outside. Yes. And this, whatever happens. And to give people the experience, the first round of doing a no but round and to feel how that closes things down and doesn't create space versus the yes and and how you can be building on what your colleagues are saying on your own ideas you can be giving voice to those multitudes and we started doing it as a playful exercise and then when doing the sharing what happened between different groups we used the same technique and actually even we're having sessions where different parts of just talked about those design teams where they're thinking through what different parts of the organization would be like before we get to the decision point we're going to have yes and sessions where different people from across the organization have a chance to say yeah that's good and how about this? Or have you thought about that? And there's something that feels very supportive. And I guess to what we were saying before, appreciative about it too, which can be important. Oh, I so love that. I'm totally into improv comedy as well. So again, one of my parts of burnout recovery was to get out the dang house, to let the family do their own thing and to go, I'm not in charge of everything anymore. And so I went and did improv comedy. And it helped me in so many ways. It helped me to express emotions that I was struggling to do. It helped me to accept mistakes because really it didn't matter what I did. It, it could be the right or wrong thing, but it was how somebody else then ch chose to see it as a gift. So that was so freeing for me because it was really letting me let go of control. But this yes and exercise is so amazing because not just like you say, that difference of saying no, but no, but and how awful that feels to so moving to the yes and. And I do it with my kids. Like my daughter and I just planned the best St. Patrick's Day party you could ever imagine. We were on a hike together and she was not enjoying it. And I was like, come on, let's do one of the yes ands. and. And of course, we made the most amazing St. Patrick's Day party idea you could ever imagine. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Isn't it wonderful? It is wonderful. And it's so true that to allow people to come in with those things, because the yes and means that you accept what anyone else is suggesting as equally a great idea, and then you add to it. It's so amazing what can be built along that mindset. Yeah, I love it. Go ahead. I'm jealous that you did the course. I'd love to do that. And I was going to riff off We've done that with our family too. Not the yes and specifically, but I love it. I love the energy that it creates. 
one of the things that I was wondering, I've been thinking like for a while, I was like, I think improv mindset is a really nice way of capturing some of the mindset that you need to be adaptive for change. And I was holding on to this quite tightly. And I had a really good challenge from the founders of the innovation consultancy that I was in. They're like, yes, and they actually did even say that. There's something about innovation, though, which I think development has got a lot to learn from, which is about the intentionality. And to go back to your point about experimentation, and you're not just experimenting in an improvisational willy-nilly way, right? You're being very intentional at testing hypotheses, like probing the system, this kind of probe and respond. And you can improvise within that. And there are moments and patterns and habits that actually really help you reflect, learn, adapt. It's not just going wherever it wants. It's quite focused and aligned to where you want to go, which I thought was a really interesting kind of addition. And I don't think that's the same as you can do if you're brainstorming again with your kids. You can come up with a whole bunch of solutions to a problem and then you look at them, but you have the freedom of the brainstorming, the yes end of the brainstorming. And then in the end, you are prioritizing. And part of that prioritization is is this feasible? Do we think it's effective? What is our logic module around using this particular answer? So I agree there is real intentionality and then being really clear, okay, we think it's going to affect this particular indicator in our logic model. How do we measure that? How can we be sure? And we need to see it shift, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely so much intent and purpose and importance of actually measuring does it make a difference? Because quite often things we think are going to work don't work. So we have to know that. But again, I love that it's just these small scale experiments that then either get put aside as it didn't work and then we move on to the next one or you learn from each of them. I think that's so important. And what you say there also makes me think about taking a portfolio approach. So you're mentioning also measuring how my head got there because it's also not just about measuring the response, it's noticing, because they won't always be quantitative. And what we know about systems, you might poke one place and that seems to work, but it's created something different somewhere else that you weren't expecting. So it's really that sensing and noticing. And there's something also to be said for the intersection of different interventions. So Something that we're trying to use a lot in the systems change work is also being really intentional in thinking through what's your portfolio. And again, this applies at multiple scales. But if I take what's an organization doing, you might have, I don't know, say four or five big ideas that you think are really going to create that emergent system or you want to deal with because they, they're holding the dominant system in place, right? And then you're being really intentional to say, okay, considering that and considering our assumptions behind that, I'm thinking of it at the moment in terms of these are safe bets. These are things that we know work. Maybe there's evidence for them. It's proven or they're keeping the lights on stuff too that we have to do, but they're pointed in that direction. And then these are the experiments that we're going to try. And we recognize that they interact and intersect. And what's beautiful about taking a portfolio approach like that is it also gives you a layer, if you like, at which to come together and learn and reflect and then adapt and check, was my hypothesis right? Was it not? Is this thing working? Is that thing working? And one way of doing it is that you've also talked in advance about criteria, right? So we'll do more of this if that thing's true or less of that. We'll move our money here if it seems to be working and there's really interesting stuff that even that doesn't have to be the criteria even don't all have to be quantitative we we can be honest that also gut feel will come in here intuition relationships but still be transparent so people also understand why and how decisions are being made yeah exactly because i think that's the thing it can be so difficult to measure these things having done multi-level interventions myself we've had these conversations okay which piece 
can we take away? And we can't always prove that all of it together is always necessary. And I remember somebody saying that. It's like, you're asking me which limb of my body should I remove? Um, And then another person said, yeah, I'd say your appendix then. So you can have different perspectives on this. So again, it can be really challenging. So that's why both the quantitative and the qualitative, the interviews and, and the gut feel is so important. And actually the conversations together, right? It's not just one person analyzing it or a team even analyzing it. It's the conversations that you have as you talk about it, as you try and understand it, that new understanding kind of emerges. And yeah, that can be different from any one of your own perspectives on it. Right. And you you mentioned those unintended consequences, because I think things do come out as we didn't expect and in potentially negative ways. And we have to be so comfortable with acknowledging that and trying to think of them, but often that's not even necessarily possible. Um, But paying attention to that, because I think quite often we are tending to feel like we have to present this positive picture of everything that we do. And this is what success looks like. But to me, success is always also knowing what doesn't work and and what does damage, because then we know not to do it in the same way again, or to understand that equally well. Yeah. And you make me think too about this at a personal level. What do I know about what works for me at work so that I can balance also my life and give energy to the things that are really important to me? Applying the same principles, it's very easy to be thinking systemically and reflecting and adapting in a work situation, but how can you take that thinking to your everyday, right? We're talking about experimenting with which days you're working or which days you've got meetings. How can you think in terms of this month, I'm going to experiment with that and notice what it does to my energy levels, notice what it does to my joy, notice what it does to my relationship with my children, reflect and then adapt if it doesn't work. Or if you think it does, if something might work even better. I totally think that's a great idea. And it's curiosity, really, to why you're thinking what you're thinking or what you're struggling with. And it really makes me also think back to there was a time when I was trying to do things as my business and I just kept feeling bad about them and guilty about them. And I was just beating myself up for this process, whereas actually maybe it was telling me that the path I was going on didn't make me feel as good as where I'm at now, where I'm trying to develop this program. And if I'm having to spend a little bit more time on it, I'm not feeling guilty about it. To me, it seems meaningful. And I think sometimes we get back to that gut instinct. We ignore what our gut is telling us because we think it's tied up with something else. Again, as a mother with guilt, that's what it was tied up with. Whereas now I'm not feeling guilty when I'm doing some extra time on this because I'm like, no, this is something that I want to change the world. And my daughter wants me to change the world for her. So I don't have the same guilt. It's interesting. That's beautiful, that alignment with your purpose. And I guess having articulated your purpose, which I think is always also hard, And the other thing that you make me think, I'm enjoying at the moment thinking about regenerative work and cultures. And there's a guy, Daniel Christian Wall, who talks about the mandala of knowing, which I really enjoy. And we get so stuck in the idea that to know is in our head. And that's true. And if you think about a beautiful mandala, there's also feeling, intuition, your body. Like, what can we do to actually tap into those to understand ourselves and the world more, right? and to feel more connected to the systems that we're part of. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope the podcast brings you fresh ideas, renewed confidence and energy to keep leading change. If you need a partner in these efforts, I can help you effectively build a thriving workplace culture for all. I'll help you overcome the real barriers to change you face every day and help you lead real change with evidence-based solutions. In particular, I want to work with passionate leaders who have tried and failed. Because I know you have what it takes and your experience will help you clearly recognize the difference I can make. For a free consultation today, 
please visit my website at www.leading-real-change.com. That's www.leadingrealchange.com. Control, you're a fighter. Push the limits and see it. You're already there. Told you we going higher. Ain't no stopping us. We're going in for the win. And we're gonna celebrate. Then we're gonna do it all over again. And we're gonna rock this place. Cause this is our day. We're gonna do it all over again And we're gonna 